The way the Git shows its diff files by default is perfectly functional, but the problem with not just Git diff, but diff files in general, is they're designed to be read by people as well as machines. Now, the problem that you get when you design a format like this is it very much limits you in the way of visual appeal. So if we look at, say, Git diff, for example, as we can see, we can show some colors, but the more colors that you add, the harder it ends up being to actually parse by a machine. All of this stuff can very easily be stripped out and you can be left with some plain text. But we don't have to be limited like this because it can very easily be read by a machine. We can go and chuck it through an extra formatter that makes it look a little bit better. So what we're looking at today is an application called diff so fancy. So let's just run this over all of the files in my repo right now. So git diff and then diff dash so dash fancy. And you can see that it does look a little bit different, but this isn't really the best demonstration of this. So let's just run it on one file. So on my X resources, for example, so dot X resources. And as you can see, it looks like this. And now if we actually get rid of this so fancy, it looks a bit like this. So the changes aren't massive, but as you can see, there are some minor changes that do make it much, much easier to actually read. But you don't just have to go and pipe what you do in git diff into diff so fancy. You can also do things like run diff so fancy and then redirect a diff file into it. It'll do the exact same effect. Or you could use something like, say, a unified diff with the diff utility and then pipe that into diff so fancy. And it works exactly the same way. But what you probably want to do with a utility like this is make it so when you run git diff, it always runs diff so fancy instead of the default diff utility. And the way that we do that is very simple. So you can go and modify your config file directly, or you can go and run this command right here. And what this is gonna do is use the git config command and modify a global variable. So if you just wanna modify it for the current repo, get rid of the dash dash global in here, but we're gonna do it for every single one of my repos. And we're gonna go and modify the pager. So the pager is basically used whenever you need to do any paging. So in this case, what we're gonna be doing is running diff so fancy on whatever the input is and then piping that into less. Now, the reason why we use less is because we still want to have that paging functionality and diff so fancy doesn't do it by itself. So the rest of this command is pretty straightforward. So what we're doing is we're setting our tab size. I'm setting mine to two, but some people like it to be at four or eight. I like two though, set it to whatever size you're more comfortable with. And these options in here, so dash R, F, X, and S, I'm just going to make it so less actually plays nicely with the characters we're going to be using. So dash R basically means accept ANSI colors. If we don't have that, what it's going to do is actually try to just show the character symbol for that color instead. Dash F basically means that if the information we're trying to print fits on the screen, don't bother trying to page it. Just quit out of the pager straight away and just show it on the screen. Dash X is going to stop any text that has any clears in it from actually clearing the screen. And then dash S is going to modify how text actually wraps. So dash S basically means to chop the line, which means if the line is too long, chop it at the end of the screen and then you can scroll over. Wrap means to put the text onto the next line. In the case of diffing, you probably want to have it being chopped instead. Now this last part is optional, but it's going to make it easier to actually navigate through the diff. So basically setting the dash dash pattern is going to set the default search pattern inside of less. And what we're setting the pattern to is a caret symbol and then inside of brackets date added, deleted or modified. So when we press N inside of less, it's just going to let us jump between each of the diffs without actually having to go and scroll through it. Now, if we go and run this command, it's not really going to show any output because git config doesn't show any output when it succeeds. But if we go and run git diff now, as we're going to notice, it's going to be using diff so fancy instead. So it looks considerably better now. If you do happen to be missing some colors in places, what you need to do is make sure your color UI is set to true. So if it's not set to true, it'll look a little something like this. But you'd probably notice that there's something not really working as it should when you're just running git diff as you normally would. So what we need to do is basically go and run this command right here. Obviously modify it in the config file. Modify our color UI and set it to true. Run git diff again. And as we can see, the color is working as it should be. Now, as for setting the colors of diff so fancy, it's not actually done through the diff so fancy application, but there is a shortcut for it inside of it anyway. So if we look at the help page, as you can see, there is a dash dash set dash defaults. This is going to set it to the colors that are recommended by the developer. And they're also the colors that I'm using on my system. So 
you can go and run that, but the other option is go and looking at dash dash colors instead, and this will actually show you the commands that are being run. So we already have the color UI being set, and then we have all of these other ones as well. The best way to work out what colors actually do is to go and experiment for yourself, but luckily for you, I've gone and actually done that for you already. So this part right here, this is the old normal, and this part is the old highlight. Now, the only time the normal and the highlight colors are going to be used is when you have something here and then something being highlighted as well. And then the same is going to be true for the new colors as well. So this part right here is the new normal, and then this part right here is the new highlight. Now, if you don't have anything being highlighted, it's just going to use the new and old colors instead. So this part right here is old, this part right here is new. Then meta is going to be used for this part right here, which shows the name of the file and what's actually happening to it. And then frag is going to be used to actually mark what fragment you're actually looking at right now. The only one I haven't been able to discover is white space, which should seem pretty straightforward, but I've modified the value, I've changed the color, I've stopped it being reverse, and it doesn't seem to actually been doing anything. So I'm not really sure what this is supposed to be related to. Anyway, when you set the color, it takes in multiple values enclosed inside a quotation mark. So the first one is going to be the foreground color. And then the second value is going to be the effect to actually do on the foreground. So we have bold, which is self-explanatory. We have dim, which is going to require you to actually have your dim colors enabled in your terminal. UL for underline. Blink, which is going to make the text blink, but that might not work in every single terminal. It does work in ST and Alacrity, though, and then Reverse is going to swap the foreground and the background color. Now, after the foreground, you don't actually need to include an effect. You can just include the foreground color and then a background color. Then after the background color, you can include an effect for the background. Now, as for the colors you can use, you can use one of the basic eight ANSI colors in your terminal. So white, black, red, cyan, green, blue yellow, magenta, oh, that's all of them. You can use one of the basic eight colors, or if you have a 256 color terminal, which you probably do, unless you're running this inside of a TTY, you can use between one and 256 to refer to one of those colors. So in this case, we're using, say, color 52, which is a darker red, and color 22, which is a darker green. Obviously, if you're running something like, say, Pywall, then red might not actually be lined up to red, but that's gonna be something you have to deal with on your system. So we can keep setting colors inside of the terminal, or we could go and set them inside of the config file directly. So besides the colors, there's a couple of other things we can modify as well. So change hunk indicators is basically going to change how this part right here actually looks. So right now it's actually showing, you know, the line numbers and things like that. But if we want a more, I guess, not user friendly, maybe a more minimal way of looking at it, we can go and set this one to true. And if we run this again, as we're going to notice, Basically, it shows us where the chunk actually starts, but no other information about it. Now, I already had strip leading symbols set to true, but it didn't actually go and strip the symbols out until I actually set the change hunk indicators. So I have a feeling that there might be a slight bug in the current version of this application where this is actually modifying both of these values at once. But normally, if you want to get rid of those symbols on the side, what you would do is actually go and set that one to true. So if we go set this back to false, as you can see, there's no plus or minus signs here. If we run it again, now the plus and minuses are back. So mark empty lines is whether to show the plus and minus symbols on lines that are empty. So by default, it's set to true. And if we run that on my Xnet RC, as we're going to notice, it shows just a square here indicating there is an empty line, but it doesn't actually show us the plus and minus. So if we set this to false instead. I think this is actually configured backwards. If we run it anyway, as we're gonna see, now it actually shows our plus symbols. The rule of width I'd recommend not touching because this is basically going to define how long this bar actually is. And if you have it set to nothing or you don't have the value set at all, basically it's going to make the bar as big as it actually needs to be. So this time it's going to go across the entire screen. One thing you might want to do though, if your terminal is not playing nicely with Unicode symbols, is set use Unicode ruler and then set that one to false. So I've got it set to true, which is the default value. And if we run this again, basically it's going to make the bar, but this time with dashes, you might actually prefer the look of that anyway. So that's how you go and do that. There's a couple of advanced features mentioned on the GitHub page, but there's two in particular I want to mention. So if you run git dash dash no dash pager, and run diff. This is going to run git with no pager and still output the diff. So this is going to be the default version of the diff. And you might want to make a git alias that lets you output an unformatted diff file, especially if you want to go and send it to other people. So what you can do is make an alias, call it something like say patch, 
and run this command right here. So exclamation mark git dash dash no dash page and diff, which is the same thing we did before, but we're also going to run it with dash dash no color as well. And if we just run git patch here, as we're going to see, it's just a diff with no coloring whatsoever. So I think that's going to be pretty much everything for me. Now, obviously, the way that diffs work out of the box is perfectly fine. And if you've been using them up until this point without really modifying them, that's not really that big of a deal. But if you do want to have something that looks a little bit better, maybe try out Diff So Fancy or some of the other applications that do basically the same job because... Diffs are great for reading with computers, and because they're great for reading with computers, you can go and modify them to make them easier to read for yourself with not much hassle at all. So I think that's pretty much everything for me, but before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to Chris, Joachim, Donald, Corbinian, Andre, Nathan, Monster, Will, Chico Bento, Joseph Mitchell, Peter D, Road, Tony Tushar, and all of my $2 patrons. If you want to go and support, I've worked them links down below to my Patreon, subscribe, star, leave a pay, all of that sort of stuff. I've got my podcast, Tech Over Tea, available basically anywhere. And then this channel is available on Odyssey, Library, and BitChute if you want to watch on a platform that isn't YouTube. So I think that's pretty much everything for me, and I'm out.